my name is Magif, uh, and uh, this uh, 40 minutes, or, um, I will be telling you my story about how I leave after uh, leaving business objects. Um, and I qualify myself as a, a veteran of object-oriented programming. Um, I, I began, uh, well, actually I began uh, before OP. I began with uh, Fortran at the university and then uh, with uh, languages like Pascal and C, even Prolog. But from, from the beginning of 90s, I, I've been uh, working with um, uh, OP, with C++, and then uh, with uh, C Sharp. And uh, you can judge from my various of my nicknames. Uh, on GitHub, my nickname is Object. And my Twitter nickname is OO Object, because like Object and O Object were, were already taken. So it, it probably gives you a hint about uh, my relationship with uh, object-oriented development. So uh, then the, there must be some serious consideration for, for a person like me with GitHub nickname object to, uh, to start, like to, to, to shift the paradigm. So I'm going to uh, present you my story and like motivation back uh, decision and uh, how I feel today about that. Uh, and uh, I want to start with disclaimer that this talk is not about like trying to find the, the one and only best programming paradigm. Uh, if you are happy with uh, the way things around yourself now, and if you're living in OP world, that's fine. Because uh, we, uh, we should build environment, professional environment around us. And, and we should use paradigms uh, that, that match our vision, that match our uh, conceptual view of the things. Uh, and uh, it's only when we start being unsatisfied with things and, and being pragmatic, most of us as developers are pragmatic, then uh, typically we uh, try to look around and see see, okay, what, what, what I can do to Im improve my uh, professional workflow. There's a great article by Eric Sink. Uh, Eric Sink, he's uh, uh, also a veteran of programming. He's uh, uh, one of the people behind first uh, internet browsers uh, in uh, early 90s. And uh, then um, he's been running a, a company source gear, which uh, made one of the first uh, pre-Git version control systems called Source Source Vault. So he's, he's quite a visionary man, and uh, he wrote. Uh, he's using both C Sharp and um, F Sharp, and he wrote a few years ago a blog post uh, which he called "Why Your F Sharp Evangelism Isn't Working," where he emphasized the fact that uh, you can't really uh, start explaining um, you know, advantages or strong sides of uh, like monads uh, or pure functions to somebody who is completely happy with uh, how things are. So you have to reach pragmatists in pain. When, when there are some pain points uh, of, of developers, then uh, they, can, they can be approached with uh, um, idea of paradigm shift. A uh, few words about our product, but we won't be uh, looking much into our domain. Actually, we will be talking uh, about more simple things. Uh, I'm working for a project for uh, Norwegian uh, Broadcasting Corporation, NRK. So uh, our, our uh, small group is part of large organization. We are responsible for uh, developing and maintaining services that uh, upload to the cloud um, media files so they can be streamed, uh, files for TV programs, radio program, news clips. They can be uh, viewed and uh, listened to on uh, tablets, uh, mobile phones, um, computers. So uh, there are quite strict requirements to uh, scalability, robustness, availability of the services. So, uh, and these uh, constraints, of course, they play also significant role with uh, um, uh, us striving to find the best tools and uh, best programming paradigm. 
But we'll start with much uh, easier thing, actually, how to model a point. Yeah, just a point, uh, which consists of like, X and Y, two numbers. Uh, I watched this talk a couple of years ago. Um, uh, it was talked by Dmitry Ivanov. At that time, he was at JetBrains. I think he worked now for a different company. And uh, the talk was about immutable collections in .NET. But he started his presentation with a simple example showing how uneasy uh, it is for uh, for developer with many choices in OP and in particular in C Sharp to write proper implementation of a very simple class uh, such as point. So uh, he showed this code, which probably how many of C Sharp developers would read would write it. You have a class point, you have uh, X and Y with getter and setter, you have constructor, and also you have a couple of methods to change X and Y. Uh, so it, it's a class with only five lines of implementation. And four of them are wrong, and uh, uh, two of them are missing. What is missing, it's, uh, mm, it's details, but it, it, yeah, it's significant details uh, because it's a reference um, in a type and then you need uh, to de declare get hash code, you need uh, to declare equality. But what is important, more important is that uh, the class as it's declared now, it's not thread safe. So uh, you shouldn't be uh, declaring setters for X and Y. Also increase X and increase Y, they shouldn't be doing it in place, changing with a uh, changing existing point. Instead, you should uh, declare X and Y as read-only. And uh, if you want to increase them, uh, they, uh, this method, they return new point instead of changing um, the values in place. So uh, in comparison, uh, in F-sharp, which is functional language uh, uh, on .NET platform, uh, you come up with equivalent implementation without the, the flaws which we saw in, in the beginning uh, by writing just a few lines of code. This is how point definition looks in F-sharp and this is how you declare um, point P and point Q. You reuse values of point P and change um, one of the fields, one of the properties. Uh, you can say that, okay, uh, developers should know what they're doing and developers should, uh, yeah, they, they can make design mistakes, they should correct them. I'd, I'd, I'd say that it's not just design mistake, it's, it's more like insufficient experience because uh, you need to learn certain things. Okay, this is how you write thread safe class. This is how you, if it's a reference type, how you make it co uh, comparable and so on. But this is actually a principal difference between a set of defaults. If you take uh, the mainstream object-oriented languages like C++, uh, C Sharp, and Java, uh, they have set of defaults, which is initially uh, unsafe. While uh, with functional programming, it gives you, uh, it, it sort of hints you to uh, write correct implementation from, uh, from the first attempt. With object-oriented programming, uh, it's, it's languages, they empower you uh, through a variety of choices. So you can actually achieve uh, a lot of powerful things, but you have to know exactly what you're doing and you have to be uh, very disciplined in that. With uh, functional programming, it, uh, it prevents you by safer set of initial choices, prevents you from making unconscious mistakes which can become important, you know, with, uh, in the project where you have uh, team members at different levels, people coming, people uh, going. And also, as we will later see, also it uh, mm, uh, removes some of subjective choices. So it's, I would say that it's less sub subjective and we'll see why. Uh, also, when it comes to um, concurrency management, uh, functional programming languages, uh, with uh, immutable state, uh, with immutable types as, as default, they are the, your path to concurrency, which is quite important nowadays. Uh, you have to, uh, even if you apply like solid principles at best, uh, they tell you nothing 
uh, how you uh, manage your concurrency, how you lock your shared state to prevent to prevent uh, from corruption, and uh, even if you care, carefully do it on a component level, the problem is that locks do not compose. So if you're building a larger application, lock management is always a manual business, which makes um, um, large applications quite hard to maintain and quite uh, easy to break. Uh, and because of that, developers uh, tend to be very conservative when working with locks. They 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 rather lock more than less. The problem with this uh, is um, illustrated by so-called Amdahl's law, which uh, uh, gives you numerical values of like how much performance you lose if you if a large part of your um, application uh, can't be paralyzed. And actually, this is not not just large part. Uh, it can be a relatively small part which is, uh, cannot be paralyzed and then you can quickly get stuck with uh, how much performance gain you get. So this is just an um, uh, example. Uh, if, you, if only 40% of your code can be paralyzed, then you're typically stuck at around 50-60% um, performance gain. So if you, even if you uh, invest and you buy 10 uh, CPUs, you only get less than 60% performance gain. So this is something that uh, most of the developers are actually not aware. How quickly you get stuck if you, uh, you if your application can't be properly parallelized. And with functional languages, with immutability uh, uh, by default, with safe uh, uh, thread threadwise uh, thread -thread structures, you don't get this problem. At least you don't get this problem at large. But let's uh, go back to a business object um, and have a closer look at at them. So, uh, class point, we began with that. Uh, there is one thing which I deliberately skipped in the first implementation. It's, uh, it's visibility, access visibility. So actually we need to uh, apply public um, modifiers to um, properties, to constructor, to methods. Otherwise, of course, clients won't be able to use it. And when I started working with uh, object-oriented uh, development, I thought that, you know, it's, it's, it's enough, it's sufficient. You have this public, you have protected, private. In some languages you have internal um, access modifier. But uh, what it doesn't solve, it doesn't solve you uh, ability to expose certain um, methods for certain scenarios, because this is actually what you want to do uh, when, when uh, modeling um, complex domain. So for example, take a look at increase uh, X, increase Y, Y. Why are they public? What if you want to have point um, in two scenarios? In one scenario, we only need to view points. In another scenario, we want, we want to edit point. In the first scenario, actually, we don't want to uh, have increase X, increase Y. We don't want any operations that edit, that can modify the point, but we need to expose them. Or use inheritance. We have a class point, have a class uh, editable uh, point, and then we have such um, usage of these classes, and I, I don't, I don't think I need to explain uh, flaws of this approach when you have hierarchy of classes with uh, like read-only version of class, uh, read and write version of class. It has many flaws. Um, alternative is um, to have just one point, and then to have point manager. So you you just keep uh, your data, point data in the point, and uh, Point manager gets access modif, uh, gets uh, the actual operations. Fine, but actually we are abandoning point as a business object. So it's no longer business object, which is a combination of uh, uh, methods and uh, data uh, uh, in, in one class. If you look at F sharp, uh, there it's quite easy to separate logic in different modules. Uh, so different scenarios, each scenario get, ha, has its own uh, module where we put just uh, operations that are uh, available for, for certain scenario. So in the, in the simplest example, if you really want to expose, like increase X, increase Y for all points, we can do like that. And this is how we can use it. But if we, if we want to uh, limit, to restrict access to those who can uh, edit this point, uh, we can uh, move all operations uh, related to point update into different module, increase, uh, where we have this increase X, increase Y. So 
component that needs to uh, access to this scenario, it needs to open that module and then it can start modifying points. And um, of course, this is quite a simple example. Uh, it may seem you know, un unnecessary to uh, have this simple, uh, to have this mo multiple modules of the, this simple example. But if your domain is complex, and our domain is quite complex, it actually um, means a lot possibility to uh, hide uh, operation that shouldn't be visible or for certain scenarios. We continue with business objects. So uh, business objects uh, in classical OP, um, it's a combination of data and uh, operations on them. And this is kind of holy cow of object oriented development. So this is all, this has always been presented as a, as a harmony. Like you define data types and uh, there are some methods, some operations that naturally feed those data types. I might say that uh, in almost all projects built using OP, uh, which I've mm, happened to work with, the relationship between uh, data structures and uh, operation of them probably looked more like this. This is a painting uh, by uh, Russian painter Ilya Repin. And uh, so you see on the front, the actual data, which has no personal interest or personal uh, association with, uh, with methods on, on them, but they need to drag them because it's a part of the same class. But those are different animals, as uh, Joe Armstrong said once. So he said that uh, he believed that there is a, it's a fundamental flaw uh, of OP that uh, data and uh, functions, operations on data, they are so different animals, they shouldn't be mixed in, in the same cage. Uh, there is a great book if you want to uh, get an introduction into how to uh, declare, how to de uh, uh, describe your domain with operations in a function level. A uh, book by Scott Lushen, Domain Modeling Made Functional. Uh, where he uh, shows, uh, actually half, half, half of the book uh, is not even about uh, like F-sharp or functional languages. So it's uh, 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 he, half of the book, he just uh, introduces you to functional way of solving or dealing with the things. Uh, and, uh, and then he shows uh, uh, using F-sharp how, how you can build proper application. Uh, I tried to use the same domain and examples which he used in, in his book uh, and uh, which is order processing to uh, show how I would have done it if I if I came back to object-oriented development uh, these days. So you have order processing with several scenarios. Unvalidated order, validated order, total price, we price the order and then we either ship it or cancel it. So how can we proceed? Okay, you have a class order with a total price, some tracking URL, cancellation reason, and some properties which tell us about the order, whether it's validated, shipped, or canceled. No method yet. So we start adding methods. Okay, we need to uh, validate order, ship it, or cancel it. So this completes uh, our scenarios. Should these operations be added to the class order itself? or they should be uh, added to another class or the manager. Because here at this level, things become very subjective. And this is uh, what I meant in the beginning of the talk when I said that when you use OP to define, to describe your uh, domain, things quickly become uh, subjective. And this is partly because you mix data and operation on them. You need to uh, figure out, okay, do these operations really belong to your data structure or not? So some developers would say that you have to define uh, methods, validate, ship, cancel on order itself. So others um, would say that, no, we do it on order manager level because the order will not ship itself. The order can't cancel itself. It should be done from outside. So let's do it in order manager. And probably majority of uh, experienced developers would go that way. But then we don't have business object anymore. 
it's, it's pure data and pure business. Actually, we split it up. So we, as Joe Armstrong said, we, we don't uh, uh, mix uh, these animals in, in the same cage. It's two different classes. So what's left from OP? Basically nothing. So today, if I, if I came back to uh, C-sharp, I would, uh, instead of uh, declaring a one, one class order with various properties, uh, I would declare class per uh, scenario, like unvalidated order, validated order, price order, and so on. Each class containing just fields, just properties that make sense, that uh, are available and probably mandatory at, at this stage. And this is also quite important uh, difference between how developers often approach class design in C Sharp and Java. You know, classes in these languages, they, they have a lot of ceremony associated. So, and because of that, partly because of that, developers typically, uh, they dedicate a file to a type. Even if you have an enumerator, often it's placed in a separate file. New class, new file. Because, uh, you know, this is uh, important decision. You have a new class. Uh, and uh, while in uh, functional uh, programming, uh, what I, I see in uh, various projects, then classes or types, type definitions are uh, so compact, so terse. Uh, so it, uh, it's much, it gives you much more advantage actually to combine different scenarios, the family of types in, in the same file and make this type definitions very tight. So this is how probably I would have done if uh, today in uh, C sharp. So it would look like uh, similar to what I would do in uh, F sharp. Uh, but if I did it in F sharp, I would uh, define types like this. Uh, again, as I mentioned, uh, very compact, very terse. Uh, containing exactly those data which are available for, for each stage of uh, business processing. Then I would define a module uh, with all operations on, on those types, like validate order, price order, ship order. So uh, the, the code to run, to execute this business workflow would look like this. So I start with input data. Uh, it's a details book. Then I pipe it. This is pipe um, operating F sharp. So it it pipes the input of one function into another function. Um, so I, I pipe it to validate order the output, which is different type. I pipe to price order with um, the actual price tag, and then I pipe it to ship order with some URI. Uh, URI. And then uh, in the end. I will get I will get a return result, which is a uh, shipped order. So at every stage, the type of data changed. I have no variables here, you see. Uh, so there is there is no moving parts. It's just functional transformations. Uh, what uh, lets us, uh, those people who, or developers who use functional languages to be quite efficient in uh, and terse in uh, domain modeling is use of uh, so-called algebraic data types. Uh, uh, algebraic data types consist of product types and some types. Product types is something that we, we do have in Java and C Sharp. Um, it's uh, analog of struct or class, where you, you define a combination of uh, uh, properties that all present uh, in the type definition. While uh, uh, some type, it's either or. So funding source, it's either payment card or bank account. And, and then you pattern match, like in the example here. So we, if we uh, can, can compute is, is source valid, finding source valid, then we can compute is either it's payment card or bank account. And then we have different computations for every stage, a step. And uh, actually, if I remove bank account part from here, my compilation will fail because I will, uh, I will not have um, complete pattern matching. In uh, languages like F Sharp, I can even define so-called active patterns. So I can pattern match on types that have infinite number of values. Like here, I, I define uh, like categories, even and odd, uh, which are defined on infinite uh, number of instances of um, entire integers. 
of integers. And then I can pattern match like there are only two values, like even or odd. Uh, what is important also uh, when um, we model domain using these uh, small uh, instances of algebraic data types, uh, that it's not just to avoid nulls. Often when people uh, talk about advantages of functional programming, they said, okay, this is the, the null was billion dollar mistake. And this is a continuous source of null reference exceptions. Let's uh, get rid of it. Uh, and we have this opportunity with functional languages. But in functional languages, you have options. Uh, in the F sharp, you have uh, maybe, maybe monad. Uh, so you have, you have various other ways to to express a uh, lack of data. And I think just replacement uh, nullable uh, data with optional data doesn't really uh, make your domain tight. Uh, uh, Jaron Minsky uh, several years ago said in uh, one of his blog posts that we should strive to make illegal state unrepresentable. It's quite important that something that can't really happen should not be part of our domain definition. And, uh, and this is uh, uh, often a combination of some optional values. And we should be very critical to why we allow optional values into our domain, why, why we allow to be part of uh, business logic processing. Uh, of course, we can't really do anything when we read things from the database or we receive uh, data from external services. They, they may have these uh, type definitions with uh, with nulls, with uh, uh, missing fields. But as soon as we entered our, our domain, that, like the core business logic, we should try to uh, replace them with our own types, which are more tight and we, do, which we don't have um, optional places. There's a great talk which uh, um, goes into details of how this can be achieved and why this should be achieved by Rich Hickey, the creator of Clojure. And the whole like one hour talk is called Maybe Not. It's dedicated to uh, harm of optional values. Uh, and uh, Rich Hickey has a great uh, slide in his talk uh, showing a uh, principal difference between uh, sets versus slots. So on the left hand side, we see a set of sheep or a, a map. No, no, it's, it's a set. And here you don't have a really notion of missing ship here. You have to deal with, uh, with what you have. While on the right hand side, you have a, you have a mm, slot. So there may be some empty slots. So what you see, what you may see, so slots with some holes and you have to deal with that. And as Hickey says that you, you can see which, <laughs> which picture looks, looks nicer. So uh, uh, this is what one of uh, mm, our lessons when we, uh, um, approached uh, uh, functional programming as, as to, to make domain tight and with algebraic data types, uh, you can actually have great possibility to do that. But languages evolve, also uh, object oriented languages. And there comes the question, can't we adopt FP style in C sharp, Java, uh, other traditional OP languages? And especially since they all become uh, multi -paradigm. If you uh, read um, today's uh, description of what Java is, what Kotlin, C Sharp, C++ are, they all uh, claim that you can program using non-object-oriented uh, paradigms uh, uh, if, when you use these languages. So 25 years ago, telling C++ developer that uh, he shouldn't be using OP when working with C++, C++ would be like a swaying uh, in the church. And um, now you have a talk by Phil Nash, all, all considered harm harmful. And this talk has been uh, has delivered at CPP Con 2018. And uh, it's a great talk, recommended, uh, even if you don't uh, work with C++ on a daily basis. And uh, in the end of his talk, he give some recommendation about how today, what, what, what to use in C++, how to program C++, and it's all functional. Persistent data structures, monadic operations, functionally composable uh, algorithms. So 
yes, you can uh, use uh, object-oriented languages to uh, adopt uh, FP style. Uh, but uh, I did this talk yesterday, and this is a new slide which I added uh, after reading Twitter. Uh, yesterday there was a uh, .NET conference, online, of course, online uh, conference, and uh, there were some presentations of new C Sharp features. And C Sharp is quite evolving languages, which gets more and more um, F Sharp uh, features. And uh, uh, so there was a short dialogue between Alexey Golub, uh, a developer from Ukraine, I think, uh, and Matt Sorbison, one, one of uh, maintainers and uh, uh, people who actually influence uh, uh, C today's C Sharp and adds new features to that. Uh, so Alexey says that uh, it's disappointing to see that uh, adopts more and more F FP features because the paradigm of the language will stay object-oriented. And I would just name one thing. It will always be uh, based on mut uh, mutable uh, data structures by default. And uh, uh, Matt Sorgerson says that uh, you know, some FP features are essential, highly useful. And we see that actually it's, uh, you can write much more compact and terse C Sharp uh, and uh, it will be getting more and more features inspired by function programming. But as Matt um, admits and he agrees that if you want a full functional experience, F Sharp is a great choice. And the same can be said on, uh, about function languages uh, on other platforms. So uh, if I can summarize, what are the impact of F Sharp on feature development cycle in our team? Uh, it's algebraic types to help better express functional requ requirements. I think we, we, uh, we express our domain very well with algebraic type, data types. It's, uh, um, we're defining a lot of small types, all immutable types, immutable records. Uh, each type describe exactly, uh, there is a one-to-one -one mapping when, uh, with a certain uh, business processing stage. So for each scenario has its own type. Elimination of nulls and mostly options. It keeps business logic compact and straightforward. And I think I, I said uh, enough about this, but it's, uh, I can't really underestimate importance of that to have domain type and to make uh, illegal state not representable in your uh, domain types. And we control a visibility of, uh, of our APIs, of our uh, uh, business methods by using models, which is also a great way, great replacement to this uh, vertical, uh, vertically aligned public protected private uh, style uh, of uh, OP languages. So uh, there are more uh, probably details which I could share, but that would be going into probably specific F sharp uh, language specific uh, uh, part, which is not uh, intended for this relatively short presentation. But uh, I should probably add that uh, the main advantage we gain from uh, F sharp and from switching to functional programming is that it has shortened the cycle from specification to production. So we really uh, deliver uh, features um, quicker. We have more compact code. We have co uh, code that typically, once it compiles, it works. We still have um, a lot of tests, unit tests, but uh, I see that the, the number of unit tests failing, it, uh, it reduced uh, drastically. Uh, after we have switched to functional uh, programming. So uh, with that, uh, I think I'm done with the main part of my presentation. 